Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, we are giving the rest of the attendees just a few minutes to dial in, then we uh, kick off. Perhaps um, really we can start, then um, the rest of the attendees can catch up as we progress. Handing to you. Thank you, Paul. Can you hear me well? Loud and clear. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, I'm sure there will be, be more of our colleagues joining us as we go along. Um, so, so we decided to, to, to um, host this, this event uh, on, on financial crime loss, uh, loss prevention and, and recovery, uh, specifically for insurance. And I think it's very timely over the, the last um, number of years, probably a bit longer. Um, we've been definitely doing a lot of work in this, in this area. Um, and, and it's much broader than, than I think um, we sometimes acknowledge. Uh, it, is, it is certainly something that, that is a significant risk. And I think in tough times like we're experiencing right now, um, the operational losses um, that we are suffering, uh, that's potentially where, where we can pull back um, some of our, our, our margins and, and, and to make sure that, um, I think it's time that we do things a little different. Um, I know the banks went through the way that they re evaluating loans and the like because of what they're going through. I think insurance, is in a, in a very similar situation where um, I think it's a small things that, that we will do going forward um, that will make a difference. So Rosa, um, one of my partners will join us shortly and, and she will go through some of this, but, but let me kick this off. Um, my name is Billy Ulofs. I'm, I'm leading the Forensic Risk and Compliance Division for, for Anjawala and Kana. Um, it's not new anymore. We started uh, this division about three and a half years ago, um, and, and we fully integrated um, with, with our law firm right now. Um, I, I have to say something about our African legal network, and, and I've seen the names on there uh, that, that, uh, that attends. So I, 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 I know that most of you, you are familiar with ALN and where we operate, but it's an alliance of, of independent um, law firms across the continent in, in the countries you can see on the, on the screen. Um, and we're really integrating more and more. Um, it, is, it is something that's, that's not only close to our hearts, but it's close to the way we deliver and our delivering model. So we, we do work across the continent and we reach out to firms that we really know. We know their quality. It's something that we can control um, and, and, and we, wait, we know um, the integrity and the way that they operate. 
So, so ALM is, is very close to our hearts and it's, it's, we are integrated part of, 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 of the Alliance. Uh, the panel today, uh, Rosa will, will, I'm sure, introduce herself. She will, like I said, join uh, shortly. Myself, I've done some introduction. I've been in East Africa for, for, for a very long time, 11 years. Um, and, and I do think that, um, I mean, over the last, just, just, just to mention over the last uh, eight months, um, the Forensic Risk and Compliance team, uh, we were uh, operating in 15 countries across, across the continent. So we are claiming that we, 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 we know the continent quite well. Um, Paul, Paul is a, a senior member of, of the forensic team and he's doing lots of work in the compliance space. Uh, he's, he's doing lo lots of work in the fraudless management space and then investigation specifically for, for the financial sector. Uh, Steve Crystal uh, leads uh, Sedgwick's uh, claims uh, fraud um, team. He's very experienced with over 25 years with the, the, the company and um, he's an expert in terms of financial crime, um, he, mentioning in the UK, but I mean, we know the trends are global and, and he will share with us very interesting uh, not only really methodologies, but, but technology, state-of-the-art te technology that they are using uh, to cut through the complexity of, of uh, specifically claims fraud. Um, what do we want to, to cover today? Um, there, are, there, there are a couple of things that I think we want to achieve. First of all, I think, and I mentioned that um, we do have some challenges in, in the sector. Uh, we've got uh, plenty of, of um, insurance companies. Um, I do think, and this is my personal view, we're probably going, we will probably go eventually through like some sort of consolidation. We're seeing some uh, international firms coming in uh, and the likes, Pan-African-wide as well. So I do think that, that, that we're in for change. Um, Rosa will speak to us um, about, about governance, um, the risks around insurance, uh, what we should be doing, what we should be thinking about, uh, and, and, and good go corporate governance, what does it look like? Uh, so, so Rosa will go into uh, quite a bit of detail in terms, in terms of that and really uh, paint the background, give us the background um, and, and the context uh, for, the, for the presentation. Steve then will we'll go through and, and really uh, um, share with us best practice and, and the things that they practically are doing. I mean, they are, they are dealing with, with millions and millions of claims globally, uh, and they will share with us some of the technology that they're using, some of the uh, AI that they are using, which really I believe is the way forward and the way uh, that we want to manage um, our fraud risk specifically, and I think to, to, to a wider extent, not only um, uh, risk in terms of our claims, but, but even to extend that to other processes and the likes as well. And then between myself and Paul, we'll deal with uh, fraud a bit broader. So go through the entire value chain of, of, of insurance to understand the different uh, cycles of insurance, underwriting. I mean, uh, it's so broad, um, the investment, the cycle um, claims and the like. So a broader view on, 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 on fraud and leakage within, within the insurance sector and very specific to, to what we see uh, and what we experience on a, on a daily, weekly basis uh, in the sector. We'll also share with you um, some of the red flags that we are seeing um, and the, 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 the policies, processes and technology and the framework that, that you can actually implement. It's not, a, it's not a, a sprint, it's a marathon, but you can start implementing small, uh, tiny things that, that really can make a massive difference uh, within your organization when, uh, when you approach it more holistic. I will talk a little about the, uh, about the fragmented approach, which I believe we all uh, fell into this habit of uh, reacting to ind individual threats and risks. Whereas sometimes if we step back a little bit and have a more broad holistic approach, I think it, 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 it can, we, we all can benefit from it and we can build uh, better uh, organizations by, 
by doing that. And then obviously uh, we will have some, some time for Q&A uh, after that. Has Rosa joined us, uh, Paul? Yes, um, Rosa is on. Um, Rosa, please confirm um, that you are with us. Um, you may be on mute, Rosa. Rosa, are you there? I see that you're still on mute. Yes. Yes, yes, I am Paul. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm welcome. Uh, we're just um, starting uh, the uh, discussion. So uh, please go ahead, Rosa. We are at the introduction um, uh, section. Hello, Rosa. So R Rosa and um, Willi are currently traveling. The, they are, uh, Rosa is somewhere in the Middle East and Willi is somewhere in Southern Africa. So um, still every now and then uh, we'll align technology. I see she's dropped off the call. Perhaps she's there. Well, may I suggest that, that we go to the section, uh, Steve section, um, and then if and when Rosa is on again, she can deal with the governments, but at least we can deal with Steve's section and then uh, we can do the other section as well. And then hopefully Rosa uh, will be uh, on by then. Sure, sure. Steve, um, setting up your slides, please wait. No problem. Happy to do it now. There we go. All right. Um, if you uh, just hold on that slide for me, Paul, I'll say a few words and then we'll 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 move on. Um, you you can hear me and see me, okay? Check that. Um, loud and clear, Steve. And um, okay, uh, good good stuff. Well, look, good good morning, everybody. Well, good morning from where I am, which is um, in Manchester, in the north of England. Uh, some of you will know Manchester for. Sporting reasons, probably. It normally rains here all day, but today we have a beautiful spring spring morning. So um, everybody has a spring in their step in this area this morning. It's rare, but uh, it, it's good to be with you all. Um, uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity uh, to be with you today. In fact, I'm excited to be here today. Uh, this is my one of my early experiences of, of interacting with the Africa market. Um, I hope you find the six slides that I prepared, um, beneficial uh, and insightful. Um, Paul, if I'm correct in thinking that we are going to make sure that everybody attending today is going to receive these slides in some sort of PDF format uh, afterwards. So if that helps um, the attendees not having to worry about uh, writing everything down that I'm going to show you, then that's, uh, that's a good thing. So we'll make sure the slides come out to you. Uh, to come out to you afterwards. Um, if you'd like to just move on to the next slide, Paul, for me, please. Okay, so what I thought I would do, everybody, is just start uh, by providing you with, a, with an overview of Sedgwick's um, international approach to tackling claims fraud. Um, and if I start with the top left of the slide and, and just give you some background first, um, we have had a, a claims fraud proposition in the UK um, and the US um, for a number of years. But um, I, I, what I've described in that uh, section of the slide is a growing appetite um, from insurers over the last uh, 18 months to two years. We, we've seen that um, internationally, wanting to understand more about what we are doing to tackle claims fraud, but also how we can help insurers tackle claims fraud. Uh, and when I refer to insurers, it's not just those with a global presence. Um, the appetite is also coming from insurers who only operate 
in their local in-country market. But it's definitely international, in fact, global. Everybody wants to understand uh, how, we can, how we can help them uh, tackle claims fraud. If I move you across to the top right of the slide, client requirements. What do insurers want to talk to us about? Essentially, the discussion themes are similar and fall into three categories. A desire to help them protect their reputation. Um, really importantly, help them keep their genuine customers, which is the majority. The majority of insurance claims are genuine and valid. Um, so that's a really important area uh, uh, for, for insurers. Uh, and to save them money. They tend to be the three discussion themes that we, uh, that we bump into. Running across the middle of the slide, I've captured our strategy for tackling claims fraud internationally. And I'll take you through that. Firstly, to the left, for all our countries, um, where we uh, already have uh, a claims fraud strategy, it's about reviewing it, updating it, and strengthening it uh, as appropriate. But where we don't, it's about developing one. So I've referenced there, strengthen and develop, and they are our two focus areas for all the countries that Sedgwick operates in. Secondly, in the center of that banner going across the middle, I've talked about locally compliant strategies. And I think this is a really important point. We have to ensure that our strategies are locally compliant. I've already found that we need to react differently country by country. We have to recognize that there could be no one size fits all because we have different legislation, different regulation, compliance, the market approach can vary, culture is a big one, policy wordings and the like. Uh, it's different everywhere you go, but there is definitely enough common ground to establish what I've referenced there as a global network approach. Um, as, as I've referenced on the slide. And that's because very simply, uh, in any language, claims fraud is bad news. I think that's an internationally recognized uh, aspect. And that gives us the mandate to start tackling things globally, uh, but thinking locally. Um, and then to the right, I've talked here about framing our approach consistently around the core focus areas of detecting and containing suspect claims. And I might use those terms a little bit because they recognized market terms, detecting suspect claims and containing suspect claims. So I ought to just uh, clarify what I mean by that. Detecting suspect claims, this is claims handlers spotting and referring uh, suspect claims from their portfolios. Sometimes you might hear that activity referred to as screening, uh, but the market term is detection containing suspect claims this is triaging those claims that have been identified as suspect um, a fraud expert doing that and determining the appropriate next steps and that might include investigating the claims that warrant it so detection and containment um, terms that you might hear me use and internationally recognized market terms i think and then uh, just to the two bullet points at the bottom of the slide where i've captured my my um, firstly, to the left, um, to provide in-country uh, and cross-border uh, investigations for clients across all product lines uh, globally. Um, and secondly, to the right, with an eye on the future, um, I've talked here about applying technology and data solutions that we are uh, investing in uh, in the UK. There are some exciting developments, and I'll expand on those uh, shortly. Uh, thank you, Paul. If we can move on to the next slide. Um, so here, I just thought it would be helpful if I expand on detection and containment, those terms I referenced a moment ago for you, a little bit more information around how we actually do that. So detecting suspect claims to the top left to begin with, this is just to remind you is claims handlers and loss adjusters and um, anybody in the, in, in the claims uh, structure, <coughs> excuse me, spotting suspect claims from their portfolios. And our process is built around a guarantee to do that. I've referenced there a screening guarantee um, to identify concerns. So we make sure 
that for every claim that we handle, <clears throat> whatever the product line, um, we screen that claim for fraud concerns. Um, primarily, that is about human or colleague intervention using a checklist of some description. We call it red flag indicators, but you might hear the term key investigation indicators um, uh, uh, amongst others. But uh, it's a colleague intervention uh, it is also the use of external sources where appropriate. This might be information coming from databases. And increasingly, it's about technology, uh, for example, artificial intelligence, which I'm going to talk to you about in a moment, uh, and, and um, uh, solutions like voice risk analysis, which I'm not going to talk about today is a bigger topic, uh, but happy to uh, provide information on that separately to anybody who might be interested. So primarily detecting is about the human intervention but increasingly, it's about the partnership between human and technology as we support colleagues uh, with their activity by providing a techn technology, uh, technology input. To the right, triaging suspect claims. Um, and essentially, um, this is the careful and considered scrutiny of a referral from a colleague by a specialist, a fraud specialist, to determine the next steps. And I've captured there some of the activities uh, that a colleague from the fraud team might do to scrutinize a referral and determine the next steps for it. Is it in fact a false positive? The claim is actually okay and can go back to the colleague to be fulfilled. Or is it a claim that uh, requires some sort of investigation, the concerns of deemed to be well-founded. And I've captured there some of the uh, some of the activities that a specialist might do. Um, probably the one to, to, to focus on is the bottom one there. I've talked about interpretation. It is very much every case uh, on its merits, ultimately. Um, but that's triaging to the bottom left, investigating suspect claims. So these are claims that have been through the detection and the triage element. Uh, so this is the main focus of, of, of the containment activity I referenced uh, before. Um, and we will investigate suspect claims that have been through that triage process that I've just described. But increasingly, and, and I thought this might be of interest to you, this is also direct instructions from insurance companies where the detection element and the triage element has been uh, undertaken in-house by the insurer and they require some sort of eyes and ears support. It might be a visit, it might be some desktop investigations, it might be a combination of them both. But increasingly we are seeing more instructions around the world uh, coming direct from insurers as opposed to uh, through the portfolio of claims that Sedgwick handles. And as an investigator, we will typically focus on three areas, which I've described there. Um, we will always look at the underwriting and background elements of a policy. We will look at the circumstances of the loss and we will look at what's been claimed for, whether it's damage or lost items. And I summarize that as quantum. We will always investigate under those three heads and we will use desktop and visit solutions, as uh, I alluded to. And the benefits of a process like that are to the right, which is uh, exactly as we referenced in the uh, in the opening in the opening slide. Uh, Paul, ne next slide, please. Um, here, um, I have captured financial crime risk that Sedgwick keeps across globally. Um, for each risk, uh, we have a policy. Um, and for each risk, we have a process that helps colleagues live and breathe these policies and principles. And that's from the top down. Um, and when I say the top down, uh, what, what I mean is uh, the chief executive officer and all the way down through the business. It, it's really important to set the right tone by recognizing that these risks are real, they're everyday risks, uh, and, and that fraud in whichever way it manifests itself is, is not a victimless crime. Um, so really important to set the tone from the top down. Uh, you can read the seven risks there. Claims fraud is the one I'm talking about mostly today, but you can see the other risks that we focus on in all of our countries around the world. Um, it's not an exclusive, um, uh, an all-inclusive list. There are one or two others, um, but generally speaking, these would be the seven risks that, that we major on. Um, 
Cybercrime, I've referenced that separately, third bullet point from the bottom. Uh, yes, it's a risk um, that sort of spans some of the others there, but it's an increasingly emerging area. Um, and I just thought cybercrime can be a big subject. So what I thought I would do is just give you a very brief case study by way of an example. A policyholder received a blackmail threat from an unknown source who was demanding um, £200,000. It was a UK case. And the blackmailer stated that he had knowledge of the policyholder's network and threatened to cause sig significant damage. So we arranged the team, a cyber fraud specialist, to attend site quickly, image the network, and then help protect the business against the threat. And through electronic data retrieval and analysis, we were actually able to identify um, that the culprit was an employee within the business. And subsequently, that employee was um, arrested and convicted of blackmail and uh, theft and computer misuse offences. Uh, and on the basis of a quick response uh, and the evidence we were able to capture, the now ex-employee uh, was actually sentenced to seven years in jail and the insurer saved around £200,000 worth of uh, um, either uh, ransomware payment or costs to uh, rebuild, rebuild a network. So cybercrime, you may not have had too much experience of it. We haven't had a lot, but it really is emerging and one to keep an eye on. Um, consultancy training. Uh, typically, consultancy, we assist clients internationally with strategic approach to fraud management. Um, uh, so we call it fraud management consultancy training. This is internal. So this is training colleagues, providing training externally to clients, all built around um, delivering a best practice approach to fraud. Um, insight, I've referenced insight. This is about what's trending, what products might be targeted next, what's coming around the corner. What does the data and the intelligence tell us? Um, affiliations, really important to commit to relevant institutions, if that's possible. In the UK, we've committed to the Insurance Fraud Bureau. In Ireland, we have committed to uh, Insurance Ireland and their fraud function. So if you have a, 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 uh, a body, a national body or a representative body that majors on fraud and, and they are open to affiliations, really important to build, um, build those links because it provides better market cooperation and access to data uh, and intelligence. Collaboration is a big thing. Cooperation is a big thing. Uh, Paul, we can move on, thank you. Um, the UK, I thought you might be interested in um, uh, the type of insurance fraud, or claims fraud, that Cedric sees in the UK market. And you can compare this, I guess, to, um, to, to your own markets. Um, to the left of the slide, I've talked about claims fraud by value. You can see that in terms of what is what is leaked um, and, and uh, in, in terms of uh, claims fraud across the industry, over 50 percent, 53 percent of the value of claims fraud in the UK is motor related, motor claims. So that would be road traffic accidents, suspect road traffic accidents or suspect theft of vehicles. Uh, 53%. 35% of the value is liability claims. Um, for that, we would be referencing um, public liability, employers' liability, product liability uh, to, to would be three main areas. 5% um, commercial, 4% home or household, whichever term you prefer to use, and 3% other. And other would be pet travel, medical, that type of thing. If we go over to the right and look at claims fraud by volume, we still see that motor is the leader at 56%, but the liability drops to 20% and the household really picks up to 18%. 4% um, of and as low as 2% on, on, on commercial. Um, key takeaways I would give you from this um, motor has been a perennial problem in the UK, 
and it still is and probably always will be. Uh, household, high volume, low value tends to be our experience. Lots of claims for loss of phones, loss of iPads, laptops, small pieces of jewelry, uh, small thefts and the like. We have the big claims as well, but high volume, low value. Liability, though, is the one that interests me. It's a growing issue in the UK. Uh, I'm starting to see it internationally as well. I expect the value and the volume of liability claims to increase, especially on the back of the pandemic. We don't have too much time today for me to talk about why that is. Happy to pick up with it, anybody separately. But I think the pandemic and the, um, the consequences of the pandemic, um, for insurance fraud anyway, uh, are going to target the liability uh, area uh, mostly. Clearly. And then probably next commercial. I think those commercial figures are surprisingly low. I'd expect them to, 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 to be higher. Um, and just there uh, in the box towards the center of the, the bottom of the slide, organized fraud in the UK, 11%. There's an error on the slide. Opportunistic fraud should say 89%. The vast majority of insurance fraud in the UK is opportunistic. So it is individual consumers or small businesses uh, deciding to take their insurance company on as opposed to it being part of a conspiracy or a ring. We do see that and it is growing, but it's still fairly low in, in comparison. Uh, Paul, we can move on, thank you. Uh, now, uh, this is a busy slide. Um, uh, so I am going to just uh, summarise it for you as we just begin to talk about AI um, and, and, and investment in the future. So just a bit of context first before we delve into the slide. Um, I mentioned at the beginning um, an opportunity to apply internationally some of the technology and data solutions that we're investing in in the UK. Now, to help us determine where that investment should be channeled. I, we needed to identify the key issues faced. Um, and some examples of these not captured on this slide are that um, typically access to data and intelligence is slow, um, poor even. Um, claims analysis uh, is, is sluggish. Um, so that was an issue for us. Also, how can we help colleagues with their interactions with the policy holders? How can we support the human intervention, which will always be there, fundamentally must be there, but how can we support them with technology? And what, what do we want to invest in that would be game-changing for Sedgwick? Um, Counter-fraud technology and differentiators in a busy market. So looking for solutions to these, we set out to try and find some technology that would help us tackle threats in real time apply artificial intelligence and money, um, uh, machine learning principles, uh, and just provide something that would help Cedric make a difference. And, and where did we land? Well, we landed on this complicated slide. Um, it's the busiest slide here. Definitely one to, to digest at your, at your own leisure when you receive the, uh, when you receive the pack. But if, if I summarize it for you, we landed on a human plus machine partnership approach. And the machine or the technology element is provided by a business partner, Shift Technology. Now, definitely a slide to bruise at your own leisure, but when you do so, if you just follow the journey that is depicted across the, um, the bottom of the slide, starting receive and map to the left and ending alerts in UI to the right. If you follow that journey, it will explain it quite nicely for you. If I summarize it in, in a sentence, it's an automated IT solution that uses base algorithms and machine learning. It accesses our data. It will link into external fraud and other databases and risk assess each claim for potential fraud. It can be adapted by product, so it might look different for home to motor, to, to liability, to medical, whatever it may be. Machine learning will improve its uh, risk assessments over time. And what I really like about it, what I really like about it is how it can blend tools into one program that can work in real time to screen claims and create alerts, therefore uh, facilitating a, a human plus machine 
uh, partnership approach. Now, we've partnered with Shift uh, in the UK only at the moment. Um, there are opportunities to apply this solution internationally once it's fully implemented in the UK, and that's the journey that I'm on. So that, that's where we have ended up when, when it comes to, to AI. There's also voice risk analysis, which I referenced earlier. Uh, I can help uh, anybody with some information around that separately. Um, final slide, please, Paul. Let's move it on to the next one. Thank you very much. I'm not going to go through this slide, but somebody asked me this really good question recently, which was the AI detection solution I've just described sounds very interesting. How does it help an insurance company? Uh, what are the benefits? Uh, I thought it was such a good question. I had to go away and think about it. And, and this is my answer. So to the left, I've put some, uh, some reasons why I think um, this sort of technology can help a claims department. Um, and to the right, if you work in underwriting or if you are selling insurance, if you are a new business, um, uh, if you work in a new business or business development area, why this sort of uh, solution ca can help you. Um, and look, something to read at your own leisure, but a couple of things that I would pick out on the underwriting and new business side, because I thought there was actually as much there for colleagues in that area as there is for claims. The ability to provide um, real time insight and analysis to help underwriters right away from underwrite away from emerging patterns or trends and threats um, uh, is definitely a, a benefit arising from this that probably didn't grasp quite so well or, or, or see uh, when, when we invested in the technology in the, in, in the first instance. But definitely want to have a look at it at your own leisure. I'm mindful of the time. So, um, look, Paul, you asked for a 15 minute overview of what we do in the UK and more importantly, internationally. Um, I'm very much looking forward to working uh, with the market in Africa, uh, initially via our established hub in South Africa, which um, is activity ongoing at, at, at present, and then outwardly from there. Um, very, very happy to receive any questions at the end or, or, or as a follow-up separately. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Steve. Uh, certainly very interesting, um, great technology, uh, and welcome to Africa. Um, Thank you very much. It's yeah. really great to hear what you guys are doing. Um, Paul, you can move on. So, so just maybe um, some background on, on what we've seen over the last couple of years and, and um, in, in our local market. So claims fraud, I think, and we all know is a significant problem and, 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 and Steve, um, Stephen really uh, went through some of that. Um, and, but what we've seen is that although, or when you have something like claims fraud and, and the ratios are wrong, more often than not, you potentially have a bigger problem in the organization. Um, and it, it extends to, like I mentioned uh, in the introduction, to, to other cycles of, of insurance, whether it is, whether it is um, investments uh, or, or whether it is actually your support functions, treasury, HR, um, your IT department. Um, I mean, more and more we are seeing that it's across the business and more than one department or, or, or cycle are targeted and or work together potentially to uh, to do the wrong thing uh, to the detriment of, 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 of the business. So the point I'm making it is that it's across our business. It's not only claims fraud. Obviously, claims, claims fraud is a, is a massive area, but it's across our business. And, and if you want to uh, manage fraud and leakage holistically, those are the things to, to think about. The second point, uh, before I get into some of the slides, um, really relates to collusion and the level of collusion. Um, in my view, we see new levels of collusion when it comes to, to fraud in general. Um, and and it's, if, you, if you deal with insurance, it is your third party service providers, it is your legal service providers, um, internal, external, uh, and it, like I mentioned, it, it cut across the organization. So the level of collusion is just uh, significant right now. Uh, and then the last bit that, that I think is, is, is crucial is don't underestimate the um, involvement of organized crime. Um, 
and and you know we we're not watching too many movies, but it, you all know that in our environment in in in, in East Africa, that is exactly what we're seeing. We we're seeing um, organized groups of people or, for, or organized organizations that are um, leaking money from insurance companies. And and uh, to be honest, it, they go for the weakest link. I know there are some entities that are doing quite a lot, um, and and but these organizations or groups of people are actually targeting uh, certain organizations um, and and uh, or the weaker ones uh, that is. So so in general, I think those are those are the three things that I think you must think about, and that is in my view why um, you can't implement one thing, or you can, but it's 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 um, a holistic comprehensive approach I think is the is the way forward just just the last point maybe on that and and um, after Chris's presentation I think the culture of entitlement in in our environment is is um, significant so so people are justifying um, and 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 Stephen mentioned uh, it's not a um, yeah it, it's 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 not a victimless crime, but people are justifying um, increasing claims, leaking money from insurance companies, saying that listen, I've they've just they are justifying the um, or rationalizing the wh whatever they do. So, so, so those are the four things I think that 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 are important um, before we, we we kick off now. Comprehensive risk management framework. Uh, from a, a macro point of view, why why is that important? You can go to the next slide, um, Paul. Um, and and really, there are there are external factors that are playing a role. Um, we've mentioned COVID, and there's already a, a, a question about COVID. But uh, it's it's external. Uh, we've got the elections coming up. There are so many external factors that are that are playing a a role in in the way we're doing business, the way. Um, we operate and that increases our risk of leakage uh, and put other pressures uh, or enables people to, to do the wrong thing. Regulator, uh, regulatory, I mean, that's key. And the main thing for me about regulatory changes, whenever it happens, there's, there's, there's a period of uncertainty. I just thinking about the data privacy um, the legislation and guidelines that came out. So, so there's suddenly there's like this insecurity People don't know exactly what to do, not to do, what to expect, and that creates additional risk for, for, for our businesses. Uh, change in technology, how many times have we seen that whenever there's a change in technology, whenever we, we move on to a new um, ERP system, financial system, uh, there, are, there are potential issues around uh, the new technology, how we get used to it, the, the transition from one to the other, uh, all of these create significant risk around around fraud and leakage. Competitive pressures. I don't have to talk too much about that, but it's a driver for for unethical behaviour and the like. Uh, and then changing operations. It, it once again brings uh, um, uncertainty about new operations, new procedures, and the likes. And the last one, rapid growth, which I uh, don't think we we currently seeing, but um, over the last so many years. Our insurance companies really they've done well in terms of investments and maybe growing the insurance business wasn't um, um, of, of interest but but after that phase we saw we saw uh, insurance companies really growing the, the insurance business and that also brought some some sort of change uh, and with it additional uh, greater risk in terms of fraud and leakage. Uh, Paul. So, so let me talk a little bit about red flags uh, that we are seeing. And, and we always go to the, 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 the hard controls. As I mentioned earlier, and that's exactly why I mentioned it, the moment that you've got collusion uh, and it, it spreads across all our businesses, finance, treasury, claims, uh, assessors, and, and so on, um, it's more difficult to, uh, to manage this by looking at, at our hard controls. So in other words, the segregation of duties and, and all those controls that we put in place. And, and I, when I go to, to some clients, I tend to um, look more at the, at the human element. Are we looking enough at, at people? 
are we looking enough at, um, Stephen mentioned that once again, culture. What is the culture in our, our organization? Uh, I mean, how motivated are our people? You know, normally when, when there are forensic uh, problems in a, a, an organization, fraud problems, leakage problems, there's, they are normally HR problems. Um, so, so the human element, I think, is, is quite important to think about when you think about fraud in general, abuse of authority, um, management overwrite. How often do we see that there are some regulatory or management or board um, reports that are not on time? Or are we waiting for, for reports from our finance department for, for way too long? There's a delay in, in reconciliations. Uh, just by looking at some of these, um, this intimidation, harassment, just looking at some of the, the people aspects, in my view, uh, sometimes give us an a, a indication that something might, something might be wrong. Um, and, then, and then we as an organization have to change behavior, and, and the next slides will deal with, with some of that. So let me go through, through some of these uh, lack of ethical code, um, these days, I, I think that most organizations do have um, the, the relevant code of conduct and the likes, but do we actually enforce that? Do we actually communicate that? Um, be, because that, that is, that is uh, that's key. Um, our data, the, the quality of our data. So, so a lot of the things that Steve mentioned, I think relies on the quality of our data, uh, not only from a claims perspective, but our financial data, um, is it end-to-end -end on the same system, the differences between different systems? Are, those are all things that, that I'm thinking about and that I'm looking at when I'm, when I'm going to an organization uh, and have a discussion about, about fraud. I'm not going to run through the, the rest, but, but, but we will share this and you can obviously go through some of this. And there are, there are plenty more. Next slide, Paul. So this is a busy slide, and, and uh, Rosa will deal with um, on, on the governance aspects a bit more as we go along. But this is a comprehensive framework uh, that we've put together over the last so many years for financial crime in general. So, so um, you will see, for instance, uh, oh, let me start from the top. So, so governance is key. If it's not in place, I, I, I don't think adding the rest of the controls uh, and, 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 and the processes actually helps because I do think that from a leadership point of view, there must be clear responsibilities, clear tone from the top, what's, what's expected, what, what will we not tolerate? Um, is, do we have zero tolerance for fraud? Because sometimes we find that people may, uh, calling some uh, claims fraud, for instance, uh, leakage uh, and things like that. I mean, so do we have a clear policy on that? Uh, clear accountabilities on from board level. Um, secondly, I think under, from governance and strategy, uh, two more things I want to mention. The first one is policies and procedures, and all policies and procedures dealing with with ethics, bribery, corruption, uh, and and your financial crime are important. Um, and that, that might be even our staff handbook um, dealing with what we expect from from certain people within our organization. I can deal with donations, um, gifts and entertainment, and, and, and all those, those red flag areas. And then the last one I want to mention under governance is risk assessment. So I, I don't think that um, we, the sector in general, are very good at, that, at this. Um, I'm getting to, to some organizations and what you find is they will give you a, a risk register and on page two, they will say fraud is a risk. Um, and I don't think in this day and age, that's good enough. I think we, we, we're at a stage where per division, uh, like I mentioned earlier, each and every, whether it's HR, whether it's finance, whether it's procurement, whether it's claims, each and every um, area, we, we have to do proper risk assessments. We must understand the individual risk because that's the only way that we can create uh, and design controls to mitigate that and if, if, if there's an area that we don't have to focus on, then be proportionate about money 
and time that we spent in managing that risk. So what I'm saying, follow a risk-based approach, spend the money and time where it makes sense. Then the next one is just in terms of uh, the specific controls around, and in this instance, we talk fraud and leakage, and I'll quickly run through a number of them. Um, High-risk process reviews, we know that there are certain areas in our business, if it goes wrong, it will cost us significant money. And, and here, the first one I'm thinking about is investment. Do we understand those processes? Are we happy with the authorization levels and, and the likes? Uh, another preventative matter, code of ethics. Um, due diligence is critical for me. And, and, and that is on employees, uh, new employees, existing employees. Why, why can't we go and say our treasury function is high risk and those people are going through due diligence every two years. That, that is proactive and it sends a message to individuals and the rest of the people to, to say, we, we will not tolerate any, any wrongdoing and it will change behavior. The same with suppliers, the same with service providers. There's nothing wrong um, to go to your service providers and every two years assess their, 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 um, their delivery, assess, uh, do a background check on them and make sure that you have the best service providers uh, av available. For instance, and, and this is this is very practical in, st of, in terms of um, the lawyers that you are using from a managing your 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 claims. Um, do they have the administrative system to help you support you and, and make sure that you get um, you get value for money? Um, declaration of interest is another way to, to get people to, to declare potential interests on, a, on an annual basis and then for, from time to time to do audits and make sure that, that, that the declarations are accurate. And ethics compliance programs, I've got one client that on a, a um, twice, twice a year they, they have roundtable discussions where they discuss dilemmas um, and it really raises the awareness around uh, the organization in terms of what is expected, what is right and what is wrong, uh, and build the ethical uh, framework for our teams to make sure that we all think alike from an ethical point of view. So we all are on the same page, what is right and what is wrong. Um, under detection, very quickly, just I'm going to mention, uh, mention two. The first one is, is um, whistleblowing. Whistleblowing. Uh, accounts for over 45% of, of um, detected cases. So, so we are detecting cases through whistleblowing. Uh, it's, it's by far the most effective. I can add here that normally, um, if, if the whistleblowing reports are accurate, this is where you will pick up um, significant frauds like financial reporting um, fraud and, 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 and the like. So whistleblowing, it's not only a red telephone, but it's a, re it's, a, it's a real strategy around whistleblowing. It's very effective. And then um, analytics, uh, Stephen mentioned quite a bit on, on analytics from a claims fraud perspective, but building dashboards and the likes from a, uh, from a operational point of view, from a finance team point of view, from investments can only add, add value to your organization. And that's a great way to find uh, outliers and, and, and red flags. The last one I want to mention quickly is just many um, about 15% of all frauds are detected through, through this channel. Uh, so it becomes more and more important because people do know uh, where internal audit will go next. So, so to, to just tweak that and make sure that there are some management review in, in surprise audits from time to time can really help you um, in, in the long run. On a responsive side, I'm just going to very, be very brief to say, um, it really deals with once something goes wrong, who's going to do the in investigation? Is it internal, is it external? What's the best for the organization? Who, who will deal with the, the regulator, the other stakeholders? If it's a PR issue, who will deal with that? So th there's a whole response plan around if something goes wrong as part of this, um, this, this framework. There are four more, more things I want to mention. Uh, record keeping, I think, is key. And we see uh, in certain areas that, that this is a significant problem. This is not, not rocket science, but, but basic record keeping um, will keep people honest because then we can check um, and, 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 and audit. Continuous monitoring and testing. 
I mentioned dash dashboards already. Uh, you can through things like Office 365. There are other tools that one can use, but it becomes so powerful that you've got the functionalities. It's just a question of getting people to, to build the right management information that can guide you to make better decisions and to make sure that you identify risk earlier. Data and systems, um, to do what, what, what Stephen told us, I think your data is key. Uh, from an uh, uh, entity-wide point of view, I think your systems are key. Um, and, 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 and the better your systems, the better integrated it is, the better the outcome and the be better the decisions you as, as, as an organization will make. And then on the right-hand side, you see uh, communication, training, awareness. This is something that normally doesn't cost a lot of money, but it can really make a big difference in terms of changing behavior, send the right message, uh, and telling people what is expected um, and, and, and what you want to achieve going forward. Next slide, Paul. Handing over to you, Paul. Well, um, I think it's a good point just to touch on one concept on this slide um, before uh, Rosa can walk us through the governance angle. So this slide just highlights that quite often there's a focus on one aspect of your business's operations, but there's a much broader picture at play. And um, quite often when we come in at the point of investigation and um, we do um, wonder about um, where the problem started and more often than not, it's from a people perspective because of course the people are the ones who bring um, everything together in terms of the organization's resources and the key issues such as just screening people at the right point do, does help. So very many um, matters that we look into um, can be seen um, as a failure of screening people who are hired um, many years before, grew through the organization and mastered its controls and then subsequently um, put the organization in problems. Um, on the technology aspect, um, I am not a technology expert myself, but uh, quite often on assignments, we do get to a point where we wonder, um, if you look at the logic of a technological process or transaction, um, in, in a number of cases, it seems like it was designed to avoid scrutiny. So um, the executives will rely on the tech team to give them answers on a system, which even the tech team does struggle to, to, to explain. So um, from that point, we have seen the value in terms of just making sure that if you are sitting at a decision-making level, um, all the technology that you are controlling or overseeing should, as far as possible, um, be logical to you rather than relying on, 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 on the tech team. Um, that is where a lot of um, uh, uh, mishaps is, can arise. So those are just the two key things to um, look out for um, on this slide. Um, really has talked through a lot of the process. Um, Steve has also walked us through effective technology. And for us, a key risk of um, all matters we look into tends to sit within the people um, end of business. So handing over to Rosa to walk us through governance. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Paul. And um, thank you, Stephen and Billy also for the interesting discussions that we've had so far. I see that we have some questions coming in and if there's any other question that you'd like to ask, um, um, kindly put it on the chat and we'll be careful to answer it. And we're also trying to work through time so that we leave a session for questions at the end. Well, just to set context on what we have uh, spoken about so far, um, I wanted to show this slide around recent developments in insurance, um, just for you to see what it is that we're talking about. And I'm sure we don't have to um, uh, drum this point in uh, too much. It's quite clear that um, there's a huge need to assess and drill down to why so many stories of fraud, um, uh, why all across the industries, various levels, whether um, huge um, mega companies that have been in business for a long time, or um, medium or even just startup insurance companies all facing the same sort of challenges. And I wanted to show that so that we all in the room um, are actually on the same page as to why this is quite critical from a governance um, perspective. Any board or any um, shareholder body should be quite concerned 
finding themselves in the news um, like this. So I'd like to just um, also give context around the insurance value chain so that we can see where exactly um, does the governance perspective come in. So the next slide you'll see um, there's, uh, of course, product. Once you get the, the product right, you go into your marketing. You make sure that you have underwriting um, uh, uh, piece in place and then the servicing and policy administration and then of course um, once a claim hits you then you go into claims management now all through this value chain um, um, our experience and assessment has been that there are issues that arise at various stages and at actually um, the whole the whole value chain and I want you to keep that in mind when we are talking about um, the governance piece. The last point to make um, um, from a framework perspective and from um, a, macro, uh, a macro perspective is where exactly does, um, does the risk lie? So on the next slide, you'll see there are different categorizations of the risk. Um, when you look at um, country or territory risk um, on the next slide, um, Paul, you find that um, that's fine. I'll, I'll walk through it. So there are different categories of risk. So you'll find at country level and territory level, um, and for us who've been working across the continents, we find that it depends on what country you're really dealing with. And different countries have different levels of regulation, different levels of legislation, and different levels of supervision. And that in itself contains a risk. So we found many of our clients um, 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 have higher fraud um, in certain countries just because of the framework and the legal framework in that country. The other issue, of course, is a subsector in terms of the area of operation. Are you operating in group? Are you talking about life um, uh, covers? Are you talking about general insurance? What exactly um, uh, area of subsector are you dealing with? What government um, regulation is there and what kind of government uh, interaction is there in that subsector? Then you, it drills down to transactions. And this mainly depends on the level of transactions. And sometimes it comes in two categories. When you have very large transactions, um, um, they are very um, uh, complicated and you find there's a lot of room for, for fraud in those transactions and therefore the risk does go up. And then finally, of course, the counterparty and who are you dealing with? Um, and this is um, quite clear even across the jurisdictions that we've worked with, that your counterparty is actually um, quite critical. Now with that overview, we'll talk about then what is the importance of good governance and where does it come in in this, um, in this picture and everything that um, Vili, Steven and Paul have talked about. Well, the well-known adage that a fish rots from the head um, is, is, is uh, clearly demonstrated even in this sector because you'll find that where there's not good governance, then a lot of those companies then are more exposed doesn't mean that those who have good governance are not exposed. It's just that um, uh, um, from a risk perspective, it is quite clear that where there isn't proper governance is actually um, higher, higher risk and higher exposure and actually ultimately does end up with um, uh, a higher vulnerability and fraud. So um, in terms of what you're looking for uh, in a good governance structure, what you're looking for is to understand, is there a protection of the interests of the shareholders um, the policyholders who are um, um, key stakeholders, and then all the other stakeholders, um, for example, the employees, um, regulators, um, service providers, uh, reinsurers. So the whole ecosystem um, uh, in the in, in the industry. How well does a company focus on protecting the interests across the board? And you'll find that if they focus on one um, stakeholder rather than another, then there is actually exposure because that becomes a weak link if there's an area or stakeholder that is not properly protected. And in assessing your own governance structure, you need to check how well is this being covered. The other thing, of course, is whether the governance structure promotes trust and fosters accountability. And Vili has already touched on this, so I'll not talk about it much. The point is you can have good black letter policies. Is there accountability? And do the team members playing from different departments, whether that is assessment, there's people in the accounting, um, uh, there's people in the marketing. Is there a culture of trust where people are able to um, uh, um, uh, rely on the information that they're getting cross-departmental and within the organization? And then is there accountability once there's that um, trust in place? So as to test whether that trust really is, is properly placed. 
The other thing, of course, is uh, prudent management. And this is quite critical, especially in um, uh, high growth areas. We are seeing a lot of innovation and, of course, a lot of push to get to be, to be the first in the market. Um, the con converse of that, whilst it's also, of course, very critical that you're first in the market, the converse of that is whether the product, no matter how innovative it is, how secure is it, and how um, uh, risk-free or fraud-free is it. And so that will come about from prudent management, which is able to say, yes, we need to be fast in the market, but is this product um, um, ready for market all round? Um, so that's actually quite, quite critical. The, the last thing to talk about The last thing to talk about under good governance structures is um, that it's really critical that the structure allows for robust economic growth. And why is this um, um, critical? We found that a lot of um, companies, if the company is actually not doing well and the um, uh, employees are not feeling well remunerated, the structure is not um, sound and providing growth and development for everyone all around, it leaves room for a lot of risk. Uh, and a lot of areas and avenues for people trying to, well, in a sense, make an extra penny or back for themselves. So it's actually really critical that actually the, the, the company is doing well. And that's part of ensuring that there's a good um, governance structure. Now, moving on from, from this slide, um, just to touch on where does then a, gov a good governance structure come from and how do you internally as a, a company assess what kind of governance structure you have. I've put on this slide and I won't go through them because of time, um, myriad of sources. I mean, with ESG becoming such a buzzword, um, the G in it, which is the governance part, is actually uh, been at the forefront of society for a bit longer than the ENS in terms of um, uh, being a buzzword. And so there's not a, li uh, a limitation in where it is that you can be able to benchmark um, the governance structure that you have and to see whether it is a robust structure. And these are areas which would be very happy to um, interact with you further on a company basis if they're, um, uh, whether you're wondering whether you have a robust structure in the first place and how do you benchmark your structure uh, to best practice and um, uh, what uh, other the industry is doing, even from an international, um, uh, a regional and a local basis. So I'll move on from that slide and um, mention that in Kenya in particular, we now have um, quite uh, a robust framework for governance structures and for assessing how well uh, or robust a governance structure is, particularly for listed entities. And I wanted to show this slide because a lot of times sectors do feel or, under, or um, have the sense that perhaps they're doing well and maybe they are not, and others don't know they're doing well and maybe they are. So I want you to see where it is that insurance has been placed. And this is the report from the CMA scorecard for corporate governance. So you'll find that um, um, insurance and like banking, uh, the banking industry, they, it scores high on commitment to good corporate governance. But the reason for this is because it's a regulated industry. And so, of course, the insurance regulatory authority has a governance code. So you'll find a lot of insurance companies on black paper they do have some sort or some sense of policies um, on the ground to govern this area. But as you can see, that color then changes when you're talking about board operations and control, stakeholder relations, and some of the other key areas. And this is because translating um, the regulatory requirement and ticking the box to exactly how well that is governed in the, in the, in, in, within the insurance company itself or within the industries and the, and the sector is what then becomes a challenge. Um, so this is something that um, I think should be taken note of as you're assessing your governance structures. I want to move on to what was highlighted as emerging issues. And the reason I'm highlighting this to us um, in this particular forum is because it's quite key and critical to see which areas of your governance you should be looking at um, uh, uh, and which areas are actually um, getting a lot of um, spotlighting because of what is happening in other, in, in other entities and other companies. So on the other slide, on the next slide, I have talked about the emerging issues and, uh, uh, um, um, and, 
and, and, and new developments. And I've talked about the insurance regulatory authority in particular and the principles that um, they would be pushing. So what the IRA in Kenya um, looks at, and we've mapped this across the region to see, and the, 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 the thing we found is that this is the same with the other regulators. They are really um, looking to see, do you have a governance structure in place how does that governance structure um, uh, superintend over the whole organization? They want to see whether there's independence and there's a requirement for independent um, um, directors. We've seen a lot of drill down now on what independence is, because what the truth of the matter is, is there are many directors who are being labeled as independent, but actually are just appointees of the, of the shareholders and don't actually um, uh, um, um, meet the criteria of independence that is required. And this is something that um, we've encouraged our clients to, to take a critical look at, because just meeting the regulatory requirement um, on, on, on independence, the black letter law, and actually understanding whether um, the mind that is being applied is actually independent, is actually very critical, and uh, plays a big role in, in ensuring that there's good governance in a company. The same thing with the, uh, the fit and proper criteria. Again, you'll find that the uh, um, companies are doing this as, as a tick box exercise, rather than before you get to the regulatory piece and putting in the documentation that you need um, to get the approval from your regulators. Really, this should be something that allows the company to introspect on the kind of uh, people that they are putting in for their board and for principal, um, uh, uh, the principal officer and, of course, the critical uh, management. Paul mentioned this, that a big part of um, a big, a huge risk area just starts with the people that you have. Um, the other issue, of course, is around control, um, the control function of the board. And the reason why the IRA is spotlighting this is we found that there are too many boards that are um, uh, uh, just superintending over what is being driven by management without drilling down to being actually the leaders in the strategy and actually providing accountability. And this um, flows through to the issues that I've talked about independence of the independent directors, are they actually independent? And the robustness of the governance structure. So I think um, if you find yourself in a place where there are probably one too many um, uh, uh, weaknesses in the structure that you have, take a critical look at your um, the control function that the board is actually doing. Is it management that is driving the business um, and driving the strategy with no oversight? Or do you actually have um, a proper board in place that serves as a check system uh, to, to the process? Um, just winding up on, on, on this now, I wanted to, to, to highlight in my next slide um, uh, the risks uh, of, of, of poor corporate governance. Um, what does this mean for a company? And of course, um, I just I wanted to show this so that we can bring to mind or rather tie in everything that is being said um, um, today to understand that uh, a poor structure, a poor risk management structure, a poor governance structure, this is what it leads you to and leads um, to um, uh, all sorts of losses that arise, whether those losses are, are fiscal or um, uh, financial, or whether those losses are reputational um, uh, uh, in the organization and whether that uh, then translates to loss of business. But um, a poor corporate governance, which will superintend over all the other um, areas that we've talked about today, would lead you to um, uh, facing these challenges, which can be eliminated if you just have a good corporate governance structure and then a good framework beneath that um, um, uh, to help uh, circumvent some of these some of these risks. Um, on on my last last slide, really, I had. Um, uh, hopefully wanted to put some 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 fear into you around the um, penalties that arise from uh, from having a poor governance structure and what that then translates to the to the organization and so there would be general penalties of course for failure to adhere to the standards that have been set by a regulator so it doesn't even matter that there are no 
uh, attendant fraud issues that come out or attendant liabilities that come out. Um, this is a strict liability um, issue. And the point is, do you actually have um, the standards that have been set? Are you following a, a, a framework, a governance framework that um, has been prescribed by the regulators? There are fines, of course, that go with it. Um, uh, and in, in, in many cases also imprisonment um, that goes with it. And this is just to show how critical it is that there's a good governance um, structure in place and um, uh, underscores the fact that if things are not going right um, at the governance level, then a lot of the other things will also not work um, um, as, I, as they should. I think that would help us um, just to put perspective of where the governance piece fits in um, uh, in the topic that we are discussing today. I'll hand over back to you, um, uh, Paul. I think as 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 we are waiting for Paul to come, Stephen, I saw there was a question for you. Um, I don't know whether you're ready to to respond to it. And the question was um, around the claims fraud. I think that had been mentioned um, uh, in your presentation. And the the question related to it was: Did 2020 and 2021 have an escalation in claim fraud related to COVID? Perhaps I can ask you to answer that question. And uh, Vili can also answer um, that from a perspective of the of the region and here in in uh, in Africa, what we did see around COVID and the escalation in claims. Uh, yes, uh, Rosa, I can answer that question. Um, in brief, um, we have seen some spikes in some products. Um, in other products, nothing at all. So, for example, motor claims um, uh, dropped in terms of volume because there were various lockdowns in place, not so many people driving, uh, and therefore the volume of motor claims dropped and therefore the volume of motor fraud dropped. The same could be said for household claims. Uh, more people at home, uh, less absence from the home, and therefore things like burglaries uh, and theft uh, and fires and water damage dropped because um, people were at home and therefore able to react to uh, events. Um, so, so motor and home and commercial um, dropped. Um, but we did start to see one or two unusual um, uplifts in claims. So, for example, um, in, in Europe, you see a lot of insurance policies where, I'm sure in Africa and elsewhere too, where um, consumers will insure um, single items. So, for example, a valuable watch or a valuable piece of jewellery. Um, and we started to see an uplift in claims for loss of those items out and about away from the home. Um, now, they are very difficult claims to, to, to investigate because it is the loss of something away from the home. It's the easiest thing to say has happened. I've lost something valuable away from the home and the most difficult thing to investigate and, and disprove even. Um, and we started to see an uplift in those sorts of claims um, which again was a bit unusual. I can think of one claim, for example, where a customer lost a valuable watch in a supermarket. And I thought to myself, well, not many people will wear a very valuable watch to a supermarket. In the, uh, uh, or, or, and I remember one other claim, a, 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 um, an expensive uh, necklace that was lost by a customer who was exercising in a local park during the one hour a day that the customer was 
you know, allowed by the legislation to go out and about. How unlucky or unfortunate was that? So we started to see an uplift in that type of claim. But generally speaking, to answer the, uh, the delegates question, um, the answer is no, we did not see um, an escalation in claim fraud in 2020 and 2021. And you know, I think the answer or the reason for that is that generally speaking, consumers uh, and um, uh, businesses were supported by governments. There was financial assistance um, for consumers in terms of protection of jobs and furlough type payments. Businesses received grants and government centralized support. Um, and for the most part, um, that tended to see a lot of people through and therefore the temptation to commit fraud um, was less. What I think we will see is now that the government support has ended um, and businesses, especially those that had to uh, close during lockdowns, as they start to have to react on their own again, I think we're going to see it coming around the corner. So I suspect it's still to come. Um, the government support helped people through the lockdowns, uh, and, and but I think it's still to come. And I mentioned in my presentation, liability. We are starting to see um, uh, intermediaries and uh, claims management type businesses um, open up um, seeking people to come forward if they had uh, caught COVID at work, for example, or um, were, were committed to working from home, but there was no health and safety checks at home, and therefore they developed a back condition or the like. So trying to make, in, entice people to come forward to make claims, COVID-related claims, under liability type scenarios. So I think it's still mainly to come. The answer is no escalation during COVID, I think we're just starting to see the beginnings of it now. I think Stephen dealt with the, the claims question. Just interesting, I mean, I'm in South Africa now visiting, and uh, I visited a number of insurance companies, and they were just complaining about life insurance and, and, and the losses there. Um, but you must remember that South Africa, in South Africa, the mortality rate uh, was, was much higher. Um, so, so that's from from some of the, the, the plays in Africa uh, yesterday. Um, what, I, what I've seen outside of claims fraud in terms of internal fraud and the likes, I, I think there was, um, I can't say a spike, but, but there was definitely um, significant fr internal frauds over the last 18 months. And one thing that stood out for me was the justification of people to say, but you know, the controls was, this difficult to enforce because people work from home and the likes. So they, people um, rationalize their actions by using COVID to say that, you know, uh, this is why it was difficult to, to do that. So that, that, that's something that, that's just standing out for me. I've got a, I've, Rosa, I've got a question for Stephen. Um, what, what we hear from organizations, and, and it makes sense to me in terms of if you look at your high-risk claims, so company A has got X number of claims, if you deal with the 20% high-risk claims, is that, a, is that an, an approach to take, you say, identify high-risk claims, deal with that, spend your money on that, and then the other 80% should be fine? Or do you think there's a need for uh, interrogating each and every claim uh, separately? Um. It's a combination, somewhere in the middle, um, Willie, what I would say is that um, I go back to uh, my comment about guaranteeing to screen every claim for fraud concerns. I'm a big believer in that. The vast majority of insurance claims are genuine and valid. I'm a fraud guy, but I'm very happy to, to sit here and, and, and make that comment. Um, the majority of claims are genuine and valid. The way that we identify the high risk claims is by making sure that we screen every claim, whether it's a home claim, a motor claim, a liability claim, travel claim, a medical claim, pet, whatever it is. Let's make sure that we screen everyone with a simple checklist that might vary from product to product, but we've got a process that we can evidence that we are thinking about it. Um, we coach and train colleagues so they, they understand the risks 
um, so that they are comfortable using the checklist, um, know what to look out for because they're alert to what's trending and what's hot and, and the like. So we have a best practice approach. We screen every claim, but then those that would fall out of the screening, we triage them. We don't just jump from really important list. Don't just jump from um, identifying a suspect claim to investigating it because that would just send too many customers along the wrong journey. If we triage it via a specialist, then the ones which are rated red will be the ones to look at. Um, and that's, you know, in, in terms of volume on a home, a typical home portfolio, it might be 5% of claims would get looked at very closely. On a commercial portfolio, probably a bit less, and it can vary from product to product. But if you follow that process of detection and containment, um, but with the triage element in the middle, you will start to find the right claims to, to investigate. And when you, when you support it with the technology, then really you are combi combining the approach um, for, for a best practice solution. So I, th I think that's the answer. You've got, to, you've got to screen every claim to find the ones which are high risk. And value, by the way, value is neither here or there. Um, as I said, on home claims, high volume, low value. Uh, uh, commercial might be the other way around. So I think forget about the value. Um, it, it, it's, it's a 100% it's a approach um, that we find is the bedrock for the success that we've had, but the, the savings that we've been able to pass on to, to, to clients. So that's hence the guarantee. And there was one other question, by the way, I think I saw it, which was asking about the figures. Uh, what year is the claims fraud for? If, if that's a question for me and the slide that I popped up on there, those figures were 2020. Uh, typically, we the market will pick up these sort of figures about a year in arrears. So the twenty, but I've seen the um, advanced version of the twenty twenty one figures. Very little change. Um, uh, the uh, and but 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 I suspect that we will just see that liability um, percentage in terms of volume and value increasing over the next couple of years. Mo motor will will be there as it always is, but but I rather think that. Uh, those who, who would be up to no good with their insurance claims are, are, are going to start making the move into some other areas, probably away from motor very slowly, but surely, um, as the market around the world has sort of got to grips with motor, probably more than it has the other, the other products. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. Unfortunately, we, we ran, we've run out of time, but I think we've had a very robust um, discussion and thank you to the audience for um, uh, their patience and for staying with us through and the questions and the comments that we have received. Um, 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 thank you very much. This was uh, an interesting discussion, Stephen, uh, Paul and Vili. And just to wrap it up, the, the fact of the matter is that um, we really do have very low penetration of insurance on the, in the, on the continent. And this is something that um, all of us as stakeholders in this industry need to um, um, focus on and see how we um, uh, build it up and what, 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 how we can make this sector um, um, robust um, on, 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 on the continent. And what we have seen um, as a firm across, across the regions in the work that we are doing is that there's a lot of uh, m and activity actually in the major African economies. And we are having insurance companies either combining um, uh, or uh, investors coming in to put in money in the, in the sector, which is good because that means that there's, um, there's, room, for, there's room for growth. We've also seen a lot of focus of, on innovation and uh, SMEs in terms of how do we push this product out to the masses? And there's a lot of push in that area. But I guess the overall um, message that we are giving then is um, in the context of this as the insurance industry in, uh, in Africa, what are we doing uh, in terms of ensuring that there's a sound governance um, uh, uh, framework in place that actually supports the growth and development of this industry? What are we doing to ensure that there's adequate prevention uh, um, and assessment of um, risk assessment so that uh, we are all in a place where 
we have uh, robust practices and robust policies and systems in place that support um, reduction of risk. And then, of course, at the end of that, um, uh, uh, in the implementation section, in the imp implementation um, uh, uh, stage, once there are claims on the table, how is it that these are managed? Um, how, uh, what is the assessment process? And like um, Stephen has mentioned, the things around detection um, and containment, and how do we then ensure that um, we are not slowing down the efficiency of the industry, but making sure that there's a robust process and structure in place um, that catches fraud and other risks that are inherent uh, in the claims management um, uh, process, just to ensure that at the end of the day, we have a stronger industry. So thank you very much um, for, your, for your patience. We do need to stop now. If you have any questions, uh, contact details are available, even in the invite that you got um, for this session. If you have any questions that you'd um, um, like addressed or comments, we'll be sure to get back to you if you would um, um, write to us and uh, perhaps uh, just invite you to look out for other sessions that we would have in future um, addressing this, um, this, this, this area. Thank you very much and do enjoy the rest of your day.